you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, please uh, turn back to me to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we're continuing to move through the Gospel of Mark, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and this morning we find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 13. Chapter 13, and uh, we will start at verse 1, and we will try to get down to verse 13. And once you've found it, I ask you to please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher. What wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And verse 3, And as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of when all these things are about to be accomplished. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. Then, uh, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But you be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who will speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents, and even have them put to death. But you will be hated, you will be hated by all, for my name's sake, but, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Oh God, as we turn to, to this particular passage of sacred scripture, we, we uh, gladly confess that this is your word, that these words are true. This, these words are without error. That these words stand and will stand forever as being your words. And as we approach this text, we want to do so with humility, knowing that and confessing happily that we are absolutely dependent upon you to hear, to rightly interpret, to understand your word. And I pray that you would also bring application to each of us, that we will respond to what's going on in the world today with biblical wisdom and clarity and with Christ-likeness. For we ask in his name and for his sake. Amen. So over the last three years or so, I don't know about you, but I've heard more and more Christians talking about how we're living in the last days. Many are speculating that perhaps we have entered the last of the last days. Naturally, this is the case. People wondering if we're living very close to the end, given all that happened during the pandemic and the expansion of authoritarianism in the West and the intensification of hostility against not only Christian ideas, but also scientifically, scientifically verifiable facts, and the surge in record-setting environmental catastrophes, depending on who you listen to, and uh, 
um, the wars in Ukraine and now in the Middle East, it can be difficult to know how to make sense of all of this and then respond biblically and wisely as we should. Um, Throughout the history of the church, we know that many professing Christians responded very poorly to similar world events. With Bible in hand, many misinterpreted prophecy and they misread the significance of world events. Um, Some became so obsessed with reading the signs of the times that they neglected the weightiest matters of getting the gospel to unbelievers, that they might be saved, and um, being involved in the local church to build up Christians so that they grow up to maturity in Christ. And others in history have become so paralyzed by fear in the midst of all the chaos going on in the world that in their vulnerability they were lured by false teachers who claimed to know precisely how everything would end, some of them even bolstering their claims and their predictions by performing supposed miracles in the name of Christ. In this hour, the challenge for us Christians is to respond biblically and respond wisely to all the upheavals in our, in our world in such a way that we stand firm to the very end. Now, as we continue through the Gospel of Mark, we find ourselves at the beginning of what has been called, um, mainly by theologians, the Olivet Discourse, because the Lord Jesus Christ spoke these words to his apostles while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, um, overlooking the temple in Jerusalem. And what our Lord says to his apostles will be instructional for us today as we try to process wisely what's going on in the world. Um, Now, before we look at the discourse itself, it's important that we remember the context in which Jesus spoke this, um, chapter 13. Um, If you were to review the last two chapters of Mark's gospel, that is chapters 11 and 12, um, you'd remember which events occurred immediately before Jesus sat on the mount. Um, Events that really must shape our interpretation of what Jesus is about to say. So let's remember the context. At the beginning of chapter 11, remember what happened. Jesus entered Jerusalem riding a donkey, which is what we commemorate every Palm Sunday. Then chapter 11 tells us that the following day, after Palm Sunday, Jesus pronounced judgment upon the temple, an event that we normally refer to as his cleansing of the temple. But more accurately, it was really a a pronouncement of judgment. And we know this because before the cleansing of the temple, Jesus cursed a fruitless fig tree. And after the cleansing of the temple, the disciples walked by that same tree and observed that it had been totally withered away to its roots. And of course, this indicated that Jesus' cleansing of the temple was his pronouncement of judgment upon the fruitless religiosity occurring within its walls. In connection with this, we must also remember the intensifying opposition Jesus experienced immediately before the Olivet Discourse from the Jewish religious authorities during his visits to the temple. Um, In chapter 11, verse 18, we were told that the chief priests and scribes were seeking a way to destroy Jesus. At the end of chapter 11, we were told that the chief priests and scribes opposed Jesus' authority, which he had exercised in the temple. Then in the first part of chapter 12, the Jewish religious authorities in the temple were warned that God would destroy them if they continued to seek to destroy his beloved son. But in the rest of chapter 12, remember, the hostility from the religious authorities only continued to escalate. First, a group of Pharisees and Herodians tried to trap Jesus by asking him a question to trick him. And then remember what happened right after that? A group of Pharisees, uh, pardon me, Sadducees, also tried to trap Jesus by asking him another question to try to trick him. And then fast forward to the end of chapter 12, and we saw Jesus warn people about the scribes whose religiosity was all a facade as they devoured widows' homes. And so Jesus warns that the crowd, that the scribes will receive the greater condemnation. And so this is the context 
of the Olivet Discourse in chapter 13. Having witnessed firsthand the apostasy and the demonic opposition to him within the temple, Jesus has pronounced judgment upon the temple. And so this then brings us to the discourse itself. Um, And so I've titled this sermon, Stand Firm to the End. And this message will have three points. The first I'm calling Jesus' prediction of the temple's destruction. Um, And we see this in verses 1 to 4, especially the first two verses. So picking it up in verse 1, listen now with me to what Mark writes. And he, Jesus, came out of the temple... And as that was happening, one of his disciples said to him, looking at the temple, look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? They will not be left here one stone upon another. Um, There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So our chapter begins with one of Jesus' apostles marveling over the magnificence of the temple. And this is hardly surprising given its scale and given its, its tremendous grandeur. The temple itself was gigantic. It was 35 acres Um, I don't know how big a football field is, but I think 12 football fields could fit in there. That's how big this complex was. Um, The blocks of stones uh, used in its construction were massive. To date, um, stones have been found in the remaining foundation that measure 42 feet long, 11 feet high. That's just under double my height. And stones that weigh over a million pounds. I don't even know how they move those things. (laughs) We would struggle today. (laughs) The sanctuary itself in the middle rose to 50 meters tall and was a visual collage of gold, real gold, silver that gleamed in the sunlight. Visually, it was spectacular, and it seemed indestructible. And the construction had been going on for decades, and at this point in Jesus' day, still wasn't completed. Um, So just an amazing structure. However, in verse 2, Jesus isn't dazzled by it. Instead, Jesus sees the people within it whose hearts are far from God and who have rejected him as the Christ. And Jesus also foresees the judgment that God will therefore bring upon this temple. And we know Jesus predicted this correctly because we know that in 70 AD, the Romans came in and they waged war against Jerusalem, destroyed the whole city and the temple. In any case, presumably, Jesus' apostles are quite startled by this prediction as to what must take place. So check out what their reaction is in verses 3 and 4. In verse 3, Mark now writes, And as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, they could probably see the whole thing from the Mount of Olives. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when... When will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? So four of the apostles ask Jesus two questions. The first question is simply this. Jesus, when when will these things take place? They're asking when the temple will be destroyed. They're asking for a date. Give us a date. Then they ask a second question. In the second half of verse 4, they ask Jesus, what sign or event to watch for that will indicate to them that the temple is about to be destroyed, thereby fulfilling Jesus' prophecy? But if we look at the parallel account in the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that they're asking more than this. 
In Matthew 24, verse 3, the apostles' second question is recorded as follows. What will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? So this is critical for us to understand, critical really to the interpretation of the whole chapter that lies before us. At this point in their walk with Jesus, the apostles still assume that something as cataclysmic as the destruction of the temple must come along with the end of the age when Jesus the Messiah will triumph and rule over all and restore the kingdom to Israel. So when they ask about the timing of the destruction of the temple, and then they ask about the sign that will signal the end of the age, in their minds, they are asking about one and the same thing. At this point, the apostles still don't know what we know. We know that Jesus has come and that Jesus is going to come again. We know that when he came the first time, he appeared as a suffering servant to lay down his life on a cross to save his people from their sins, after which he was buried and then raised from the dead and then was exalted to the right hand of the Father in heaven. And we also know that when Christ comes down from heaven a second time in the future, he will appear as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to wage war upon the nations, to set everything right, to consummate the millennial kingdom, and so on. And we, standing here in the 21st century, we also know that these two comings of Christ are separated by thousands of years, a, a long interval marked by the suffering of Christ's followers as they're scattered throughout the world to bear witness to Christ and to preach the gospel so that more and more are saved. That's what we know. But the apostles in verse 4 think that Christ will triumph in their day. In their minds, it's as if the first coming and the second coming of Christ are collapsed into one coming. And this is why they assume the destruction of the temple and the end of the age, they're the one and the same thing. And so this is important for us to keep in mind as we now consider Jesus' answer to the apostles in the rest of this chapter. Jesus will help the apostles, and he will help us this morning as well, to differentiate between events in the world that mark just the beginning of the end times from events in the world that will mark the end of the end times. And Jesus wants us to be able to differentiate between the two so that we are better equipped to stand firm in Christ to the very end, the actual end. And so now this brings us to our second point, which I'm calling Jesus' predictions of religious and political and natural calamities. We see this in verses 5 to 8. So picking it up in verse 5, Mark now writes, And Jesus began to say to them. This is one of Mark's ways of underscoring that what Jesus will now say is of utmost importance. To his four apostles who have just asked him about the timing of the destruction of the temple and the dawn of the end of the age, Jesus now says, see that no one leads you astray. See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. So much to unpack here, but I think the very first thing we must notice and underline is what Jesus says at the end of verse 7. There Jesus says, this must take place, but notice the end is not yet. I think Jesus wants his apostles and us as well to understand that all of the dangers and all of the calamities in verses 5 to 8 are not signs that were in the last of the last days, right before his second coming and the consummation of the kingdom of God. We must not interpret these events by themselves as signaling the very end of the age. At the end of verse 8, look there, Jesus 
restates the same point using different words. Having told us about all of those dangers and calamities, he says, these are but the beginning, not the end, the beginning of the birth pains. Well, I suppose we need to think about a woman in labor. <laughs> so let's do that. When, when a woman goes into labor, this is my experience anyway, it's great fun for all. You remember that, men? Fathers, typically at the beginning, the contractions are farther apart. Right? They don't last as long, if memory serves me correctly, and they aren't as, they're so painful, but they're not as painful. But as the labor continues, what happens? The contractions increase in number and duration and intensity until at the end, the baby is born and pain gives way to joy. Typically, typically. Likewise, in verses 5 to 8, Jesus is saying that these dangers and calamities signal not the end of the church age, but rather its beginning. These dangers and calamities will increase in number and in duration and in intensity until finally, at the end of the age, unique celestial signs will appear, as Jesus will point out later in this chapter, and then finally, Jesus will return visibly from heaven. It will be at that time that pain will give way to inexpressible joy for his people. So Jesus wants his apostles not to misinterpret future events in the world. Dangers and calamities punctuated in the first century by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD were not to be interpreted as signs of the end of the age, but rather as markers of the beginning of of the last days. Now in verses 5 to 8, Jesus tells us three major characteristics of the beginning of the birth pains, which started in the days of the apostles and which continue to this day. In verse 5, Jesus warns of the appearance of false messiahs. Jesus says, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The Greek simply says, I am. I am. And they will lead many astray. So in verse 5, Jesus is saying, watch out. Be on guard. Be careful. Lest someone deceives you and misleads you. Then in verse 6, Jesus warns us about who will attempt to lead people astray. Jesus says there will be not one or two, but rather many, shockingly, many, who will come along claiming to be the Messiah. Um, if you jump ahead to verse 22 in chapter 13, Jesus seems to be speaking of the same thing when he warns of false Christs and false prophets arising, performing signs and wonders to lead many people astray. Disciples during the first century would have been especially vulnerable to deception if they believed that all the dangers and calamities mentioned in verses 5 to 8 signaled the end of the age, at which point the Messiah would restore the kingdom to Israel. They'd be vulnerable to deception. If a false Messiah appeared seemingly able to perform powerful miracles, and in fact, we know that in the first two centuries, there were false Messiahs who arose, and they did lead many astray. And we too must watch out today, remembering that when the real Messiah appears, it's going to be plain to all. His return will be preceded by celestial signs, and he will be visible to everyone as he descends from heaven, riding the clouds with great glory and power. That's what we are to watch for. Now, in verses 7 and 8, there are two additional characteristics of the beginning of the birth pains. There is the pain, you'll notice, associated with political upheavals. In verse 7, Jesus mentions wars 
and rumors of wars. In verse 8, he mentions specifically nations and kingdoms rising up and fighting one another. Of course, leading up to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, as well as following the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, there, there were rumors and there were wars. For example, there were fears of war in 40 AD when the Roman emperor at the time tried to put a statue of himself in the temple. Rumors of war circulated. But it wasn't until 25 years later that an all-out war broke out in 66 AD, that is four years before the destruction of the temple. All-out war broke out in 66 AD when Rome, defied by the um, zealot revolt, retaliated against Palestine or Palestine. But again, that did not signal the imminent destruction of the temple, and it certainly did not signal the end of the age, which is Jesus' point. And still today, wars continue, but again, war does not necessarily signal the very end of the age. Now, in verse 8, Jesus mentions one more characteristic of the beginning of the birth pains, namely natural calamities. He mentions earthquakes and famines, and these also happened, just as Jesus said, in the first century, leading up to the destruction of the temple and also following the destruction of the temple. And the point, again, is that these earthquakes and famines signaled neither the imminent destruction of the temple nor the end of the age. These, again, are simply the beginning of the birth pains. And so Jesus says his disciples didn't need to be alarmed. As these dangers and calamities occur to this day, we must also not be alarmed either. In other words, we must not freak out. We must not be paralyzed by fear. Uh, we must not be overwhelmed by anxiety, looking to false teachers to alleviate our fears with their false promises and their bogus predictions. And we must not freak out obsessing about every event on the global stage, what it means, so that perhaps we can be somewhat in control or feel like we're somewhat in control. Instead of freaking out, what must we do? This brings us to our final point, which I'm calling Jesus' prediction of persecution against his disciples. We see this in verses 9 to 13. During the tumultuous time between his first coming and his second coming, what Jesus wants us to do is to be ready for persecution. And he wants to show us how to endure persecution so that we stand firm in Christ to the end. So picking it up in verse 9, Jesus now says, But you be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations. Jesus is warning his apostles to anticipate persecution, not only from religious authorities, but also from secular authorities. And in fact, we know from the book of Acts that the apostles were persecuted by both, fulfilling this prophecy. And by implication, Jesus wants us to anticipate and for us to be ready for persecution which might one day in Canada become physically violent. And so instead of freaking out about wars and rumors of wars and natural disasters, instead of being obsessed over connecting world events to Bible prophecy, you and I must be busily preparing one another to stand on trial before pagans because of our faith in Christ. That's what we need to be busy doing. And one way we can get ready to help one another, one way we, we can get ready is to help one another to remember what Jesus says at the end of verse 9. And then in verse 10, and what Jesus tells us is that when we suffer persecution, it will not be meaningless. Meaningless. 
it will not be without a purpose. When we suffer persecution, it will be purposeful. And the purpose will be to bear witness to unbelievers. Or to put it another way, the purpose of our suffering persecution will be to bring the gospel to the nations. And in the book of Acts, this is precisely what happened to the early church. At the beginning of Acts chapter 8, we're told that a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And then you know what happened? Remember what happened? The church was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And that in turn resulted in the spread of the gospel. Of course, later in the book of Acts, we're told about the conversion of Paul which in due course led to his standing before some of the most powerful political leaders of his day. And as he stood before them, remember what he did. He proclaimed the gospel. And so the gospel spread even through the persecution of Paul. This is, I find this immensely encouraging, and I pray that you would as well. Not only to know that God is sovereign over all our suffering, and not only to know that God's mission to bring the gospel to the nations cannot, will not be derailed, but also in, in the midst of our suffering and in the midst of our persecution, God will use that to advance his gospel, to bring it to places where it would otherwise not go, so that more are saved. And so our suffering in the hands of God is purposeful, when the suffering is all about our faith in Jesus or because of our faith in Jesus. And of course, all of this requires that we ourselves know the good news well enough to articulate it. And so are you ready? Do you know the good news well enough to articulate it? That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but inherit eternal life. But can you imagine, let's say, that one day you have to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada and then you need to stand before a panel of judges? Maybe it will be because you have posted Bible verses online that now allegedly are hate speech. Or maybe... Can you imagine you're standing before the Supreme Court of Canada because you have fought against psychologists and doctors to keep your underage child from getting a so-called sex change? It's within the realm of possibility. Who knows why you and I might stand one day before the Supreme Court of Canada except that God may it be that if we do, it's because of our devotion to Jesus and not because we're obnoxious. And can you imagine standing before the Supreme Court of Canada so nervous, you're not sure you can su succeed at bearing witness to Christ? Perhaps the apostles were anxious about standing before kings and governors, standing before the Sanhedrin. So look at what Jesus says next in verse 11. And when they bring you, speaking to the apostles, remember, to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you're to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it will not be you who speak, but the Holy Spirit really speaking through you. What an encouraging promise. That God promises to be with us to help us by his spirit to represent Christ well. And I think the way that normally works is the spirit brings to mind the scriptures we have been learning all these years or that we should be learning all these years. That we be able to speak the truth to those who put us in, on trial. And again, this is what happened to the apostles in Acts chapter 4. As Peter and John stood on trial before the religious authorities, the Holy Spirit strengthened those so-called uneducated and, un and, and common men to speak clearly and boldly for the sake of Christ, even at great risk to their lives. We have an example of this very thing. 
Now, I don't know, as difficult as all of this is, look at what comes next in her passage. Persecution from religious and secular authorities will be hard enough to endure, but I can't imagine anything worse than what Jesus predicts next for his disciples living in the last days. Look at verse 12. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. I can't imagine a form of persecution worse than this. Apparently, this happened in the first century when the emperor Nero was severely persecuting Christians to the point of death to avoid torture or to avoid death, some individuals betrayed their Christian parents or their Christian children or their Christian siblings by disclosing where they were hiding from the authorities. Can you imagine being betrayed by one of your parents? Can you imagine being betrayed by one of your children? Or one of your siblings? handed over to the authorities to be killed just because of your faith in Jesus. May it never be in our time. In verse 13, Jesus sums it all up by saying, you will be hated by all for my sake. The hatred will come not just from the outside, the hatred will come from within from apostates within the church and from within families. And so when this persecution happens, what will keep you and me from denying Christ in order to save our skin? Um, Jesus gives the answer at the end of verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus is saying that if you not only claim to belong to him, but you also follow him no matter what the cost to the very end of your life, thereby demonstrating that you do truly belong to him, then when you die, when the end comes, you will go to heaven and you will be with him. And there is no greater motivation to stay the course, to stand firm in Christ to the end than this, to be with Christ, to see him, to hear him audibly, to speak to him, to fellowship with him, to enjoy him, to glorify him forever, entirely free from sin. But who will sustain this holy motivation in you? To press toward the eternal prize, even if a member of your own family hands you over to be killed, what will sustain this holy motivation to persevere? The answer is God. I love what Jude writes in the letter that bears his name in verse 21 of his letter. Listen, he writes, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Okay, but then, a mere three verses later, listen to what else he writes. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy (laughs) to the only God and Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord to God be the glory majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen keep yourselves brothers and sisters in the love of God but know that God must keep you in his love so that you endure to the end Let's pray. Oh God, in these tumultuous times, in these times of political and natural and religious calamities, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. 
the author and the perfecter of our faith, running the race with endurance, laying aside whatever weights of sin are holding us down, that we would run the rest of the race well, faithfully bearing witness to Christ, our Lord and Messiah who died for us and was raised from the dead and whom we will one day stand before and see and that without sin and to enjoy and glorify for him forever with all of the attendant promises and all the inheritance that has been promised to us, saved and kept in heaven for us, who are being guarded by your power to persevere to the end. Hold us fast, O God, that we will hold fast to you, no matter what the cost. For your sake we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.